Hi, David. How's it going? It's going great. Thanks for uh, calling me back and letting me say a few more things before we have the people listen to our chat. No, of course. Yeah, you you had texted me after we had that, that great talk and you mentioned that you wanted to read a little disclaimer of sorts off the top. I think that's a great idea. Why don't you go ahead and, and read it? Great. Arigato gozaimasu. Um, that was Japanese, by the way. I don't know why I said that, but... Um, Irishaimase. <laughs> Okay, so I, I want to give a disclaimer that while I share a lot of the history of my relationship with my dad in this chat that I had with Jeanette, that he and I are on a lot better terms now. Um, I, I went into a lot of details and probably a little more. It just Jeanette has a tendency to do that to me that I tend to spill out a lot more of my heart and soul and <laughs> every life. But uh, a year and a half ago, my dad actually apologized to me for the first time about everything that we had gone through. And he's tried to make a lot of progress and has even gone to therapy himself, which is what we talk a lot about in this chat for Jeanette's podcast. And it's, well, it's been a process and I've had to keep my boundaries and distance from my dad and not always speak to him. He has come to respect those boundaries, which has been awesome. And I'm not talking about this experience with my dad so that people can demean him. I'm saying this to tell my story of what our experience has been, and I don't want anyone to like belittle him as he's tried to heal. And we've all tried to heal my family and I, and my dad, everybody, and um, just tried to move on from all this. So I share this. So anyone who's where we once were can be encouraged to get the help and take the step to, steps that they need to get to a better place themselves. Thanks for reading that. Yeah. Thanks for letting me. And uh, yeah, yeah, and no, 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 and and I really appreciate the conversation that we had. I I'm thankful that you took the time out of your busy schedule to make it happen, and also how open you were. I I really appreciate that level of openness and vulnerability. I got a lot out of you sharing your story, and I think everybody listening will get a lot out of it too. Oh, thank you, Jeanette. Well, you know that I've it's the same that you, the way that you've been open about your story has been really inspiring, not just for me, I'm sure for a lot of people. And, you know, I always love our chats. So whether from this podcast or just when you give me your friendly calls, you always know how to take it to a deeper level and get me thinking about things in a way I haven't. And I always appreciate that. So thank you. Oh, you're the best. I was, I was scared to leave my mom and mm -hmm. my sisters because I don't know. My mom was in a similar position that I was just being manipulated and being told she was worthless and good for nothing. And she couldn't live on her own. She was too dumb to do that. And the usuals. So I was like, I can't leave my mom. But what's weird is I felt really guided that I needed to go and be a missionary. Partly, maybe part of it was that I needed to just give myself space from like everything going on with the people I was surrounded with in my yeah. business, <laughs> yes. also my dad. And, and just maybe that I f was letting my family rely on me too much. And mm -hmm. it was time, like I needed to be there for them at, at that time, but then they needed to grow a little bit, mm -hmm. but I was scared. I, I really was. And so when I was even on my mission, a lot of my friends and close people were just like, what can, what can we do for you? while you're gone, is there any way we can help? And just, and I was like, you know what, just make sure that my family is okay. Mm. And my, what's funny is my dad actually used that against me. Cause he really was, if anyone was angry that I was leaving my career, it was my dad, even though he wasn't working for me. He, he felt like he was watching what he had helped. He had sacrificed so much. He had, he had given up his own business to, cause he believed in what I was doing so much. Like I'm grateful for it, but at the same time, I hold a lot of resentment because I, which is, it's hard. Like you look at Man. the way people are so grateful for what you've done. Like, mm -hmm. you know, Hey, be, all the work and your music and stuff, but it's like, it's kind of hard. I think that was part of why it was so hard for me to appreciate my own singing and stuff because mm -hmm. it was attached. I always attached it to my dad and it got to a certain point of American Idol where everyone else attached themselves, attached me to my dad. And so I really resented everything that was going on at that point. 
Yes, yes, yes. So. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I a million times relate with my mom and acting and, and it being her identity and her agenda. And then me just being like, I didn't even want to do that. Like what? I've done this thing for 20 years that I didn't want to do because you wanted to do it when you were a kid and didn't get to. So now I'm you like, what are we doing here, mom? But you know, yeah. Oh my gosh. Worry about her hearing this because what's crazy, man. Yeah, I know. And I, (laughs) you've been through so much in your life. It's just crazy. And it's great. What's weird is how we became friends kind of at the beginning of, I was thinking, you know, I was thinking that this morning, I was thinking how we we've been friends for like a dozen years and it was both when we were kind of in the thick of the, the, you know, dealing with, I guess a, a public life that we hadn't known before. And it was Mm -hmm. like this weird kind of time. I remember when you, when you guest start on the show I was working on and you know, well, my mom was, was particularly excited because she had plans for me and that was to marry you. She was like, you're oh going to marry David Archuleta. Oh We're going to find a way, honey. Like, oh man, oh she man. was really pushing that hard. <laughs> but I was just excited because I don't know how many people know this, but I grew up Mormon and I kind of, I, I, we stopped going to church when I was kind of a preteen. And honestly, when my career started picking up, because I don't know, my mom just kind of, we just stopped going then. I felt like Mm. my judgment toward my mom is that she just felt less of a need for faith because like, oh, well, now she's successful. So, and now she's successful and I don't have cancer right now. So why do we need faith? But then we started, I I started wanting to go again when I was 17, when I was 17, 18. And my mom was, my mom was sick again with cancer. And, and I was really struggling with like how to deal with fame and public life. And I just felt like I didn't, I just felt overwhelmed. I felt really used and manipulated by most of the people around me, including my mom, which I couldn't identify at the time. So I kind of started going to church again. And that was, I guess, around the time that you were on the show. And I just, I felt really inspired by you for, for staying so close to the faith. And, and honestly, I still, I still do admire that. But even though I'm definitely not active in any way, I don't go or, or, or participate. I still do think it's so admirable how sincere you seem about faith. Like, I don't think of you as a person who's just always been Mormon. So you keep being Mormon or who's, you know, like, it's a thing that you really ponder and, and, and explore very genuinely. And I think that's, you know, if you're, if, if somebody's going to be religious, I think that's the only way to do it is, is, not to not to tune out and numb out and be religious, but to like really pursue it and think, is this right? And do I believe this? And I think you do that. So, so that I guess that's just to kind of touch on 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 when we first met and where we were at, and yeah, why I think yeah. I think first I think meeting you at that time was really impactful for me. Yeah, no, and thank you. I appreciate that. It's it's funny because you know your mom was always around and my dad was always around at that time. <laughs> oh, yeah. weren't they? And it's like, I feel like we kind of have like this silent, like understanding of each other, but it's not like we really ever talked about it, but it's kind of like, it's kind of like, I, I kind of, it's like, I kind of have a feeling of what you're going through and it's like vice versa, but we never talked about it. I, I not until, not until I think just a few years ago, you know, when I had yeah. gotten back from, from Chile being a missionary and you, your mom had, had passed away and you d- did all this searching of your life and your past and just it's just crazy everything you had to, I can't believe your your life is just wow it's comical so okay so I, I, I want to circle back to how you started therapy because I think you were saying it was at, oh yeah right you were you were on this mission and you started acting kind of strangely or or, or yeah right is that correct yeah so okay basically I guess I'm just going to open up and what's hard is you know, my, my parent is still, you know, he's alive. So I, right. I, I always like so worried about like, it's weird. Cause even though I might have a, I have a strained relationship with my dad, it like, it has in a very strange, broken way has gotten, has improved over the years simply by having distance and just talking every once in a while. But th- for the first couple of years when I was back, I didn't, I didn't talk to him. I, I avoided him actually, which really hmm. upset him but it's what I needed. And it was actually what I was advised by, by my mission president. So Mm. when, 
these triggers happened. I didn't associate it with my dad, but because I didn't really talk to my dad while I was out in Chile as well, which really upset him because he was so used to being able to always call me. And if I didn't answer him, he would send me all these messages, texts, voicemails, and Uh. really put me down and make me feel like a terrible person because how could a son do this to his dad? But you can't talk to people while you're on a mission, right? Like you can't, that's a rule, isn't it? It's not, it's not so much now. You're able to talk more easily now just with technology. But Mm -hmm. back then we didn't have smartphones as missionaries. Missionaries do now, it's more common, but in just a few years ago, we didn't, we didn't have computers or anything or iPads. So we would have to go to the internet cafe each week just once a week and respond and stuff. But my dad, he was pretty upset at one point and just sent me these really, really rough emails. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I didn't realize when my dad would put me down and stuff and say the way I was treating him that I kept trying to find what I was doing wrong. And I didn't Mm -hmm. realize that I wasn't doing anything (laughs) wrong right? until – Actually, really, a couple years after when I got back from my mission and was going through therapy, because I was so paranoid about doing anything wrong, because of my dad would make me, would convince me that I had hurt him and I needed to ask for, mm. for, for his forgiveness Ugh. when I hadn't done nothing. And at least nothing to hurt him other than, oh, the only thing he wanted was for me to give him full control of my life and my my decisions and my and surrender just, your being to him. That's all. Yeah, yeah. And when I wasn't willing to, he'd get so mad, right. and so I'd. It was just a weird dynamic. But when he sent me these emails, like almost two years into my mission, when I was nearly done, right, I got triggered, and I stopped talking which is weird because I was in a leadership position in my mission where I was having to make decisions and give guidance to others and was helping a lot of people in the area I was working as well. Sure. And it got to a point where one day I was with my mission companion and he just said, which way are we going? And I couldn't respond to him. Hmm. And all I had to say was left or right, basically. And I couldn't, I wouldn't... It was like I wouldn't speak, but it's also fe- I felt helpless, so I couldn't speak, and I've just felt like this darkness was just coming over me, like, and I just needed help. Wow, that sounds but so I visceral. I felt like I wasn't allowed to ask for it because I didn't deserve it, and mm. I didn't know why I was acting this way. I didn't re- I didn't associate anything with my dad and what he had emailed me. He he sent me literally like pages and pages worth of of email just in this, these two emails he sent me, basically just telling me how horrible of a person I was, but in a very manipulative way. Oh, I know those emails. I know those types of emails quite well. It, I've, I've, I know the all caps, scathing, <laughs> mean emails very well. Wow. So, okay, yeah. so he's sending you these emails. You physically can't even find word. Like it sounds so, so like such a physical reaction you're having. Yeah, it was... It was, and I couldn't speak, and it, it, I don't know. It's it's hard for me to talk about just because it also brings back the American Idol time. Like, I really didn't want mm. – like, I just wanted to get through the competition, and I feel like the reason why things got the, as bad as they did was because of how much pressure that put on my – and my dad's relationship. And Right. I don't want to talk about it just to bring back that, to relive that experience on American Idol. Cause that was really hard on my family. You know, mm. my family didn't have the same dynamic with my dad that I did. Mm-hmm. And so I don't like to talk about this and be able to look at people and say, Oh, look how horrible Jeff Archuleta is. I like, I don't, I'm not talking about this. Like I, I really don't want, I don't want to relive that. I'm just, Sure. trying to talk to give perspective of where I've come from. You know, I, no, I don't absolutely. have that. But I, I guess 
that's one of the things why American Idol was hard for me and to look back at it was, you know, I, I loved being able to go on. It was really hard. The hardest part I'm about sure. it was that everyone wanted to talk about how horrible my dad and me were. And I just, mm. I don't know. I just, I hate how public that became, but I guess that's of what course. comes sometimes. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's an unbelievable amount of strain. It sounds like, and pressure and, and, and yeah, to have all that happening at that time is just, it must've been feel, felt like so much weight on your shoulders. Yeah. I, I, when I got those emails and I was letting it kind of twist like a storm around my mind for the next couple of days after I mm-hmm. had received those emails, I was stuttering a lot. I couldn't talk. My voice was going really high and like insecure. Like I was talking like a kid again which is why it's hard for me to look at American Idol times because I don't know, it just brings back that. But yeah. Yeah. So it's like a love hate relationship I have. It's like, I don't want to discredit the amount of support and things that people give to me, but at the same time, it's like the psychological (laughs) aspect of it that it had on me. was just kind of weird to look back on. But Mm -hmm. so I was talking like a kid and I wasn't even realizing I was doing this. So I was here. I was on my mission as a yeah. 23 year old talking like beginning to talk like a kid stuttering i couldn't make my own decisions i would i would say i don't know a lot i would just i'd become very insecure i would i would talk down on myself a lot yeah 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 basically laugh at how stupid i was a lot of times and so oh, my man, mission president so brought sad. me in he just said what's going on he's like you're not you're not acting like yourself. And for me, I was like, what are you talking about? It was so weird. Like I knew I felt, I felt this huge weight on me. Like my world was going to end, which is weird. I feel dramatic saying that, but it's, I felt that I felt like I was about to collapse. And so at the, it was, but at the same time I was like, but everything's fine. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm like, I don't know what you're hinting at um, president Warren, because everything's fine. And he's like, you're not acting like yourself. There's something, there's something wrong. And I couldn't tell him, but I actually had in my bag, I had the letters, the emails my dad had sent me Ah. because I had to print them out. They were too long to read Yeah, yeah, yeah. at the time I had in the internet cafe. And there's a little voice in my head. You know, I, I really feel like we have, we can have godly intervention and divine guidance in our lives and I always call it a still small voice because as negative and as shouty as the other voices in your life can be mm-hmm. and telling you what to do and yelling at you. And at this point, I, f- I felt like this darkness was yelling at me and telling me how worthless I was and good for nothing I was. Mm. There was this like little glimpse for like just a moment saying, hey, give these letters to your, to your mission president. Mm-hmm. And uh, then there's like another voice in my head screaming at me saying, no, how could you, there's no way, how could you, you would be betraying your dad, your own father. And so that was really hard for me because I really didn't want my dad. It was like, I wanted my dad to also approve me and love me as well. Uh, And uh, so I was like, how could I do this and ruin my dad Mm -hmm. and make him feel think that I hate him by exposing him. I can't do that to him. And it was, so it was really hard. Cause it's like, I felt like I had to defend him for so many years, especially during Ugh. the American Idol time. Like I was the only way, like sometimes my dad would be like, you're don't, it's like, you need to be able to stand up for me because everyone's talking so bad about me and it's affecting our whole family. And it was. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, I can't like, here I am like four years later saying, I can't, give these emails because it would expose my dad and I can't do that. But then I just heard it again. I was like, you know what? Just give it. So I did. I gave, I said, I don't know how to, to my mission president, uh, president Thomas Warren. I said, I don't know how to explain it to you. I don't, I don't even know what to say, but maybe if you read these, you'll understand. And I handed them over to him. And I, there was a part of me that felt really guilty, but my mission president brought me back in and he said, so I read those letters, those emails. And he said, this is totally a abuse. And I looked at him and I actually laughed. I got very defensive, oh, which is kind yes. of weird. Yes. Yes. No, oh one my had, God. no one had ever 
said that to me. Like everyone would always, uh, you know, people would say really snarky things about my dad and make fun of me and put me down and say like, oh, you're stage dad and blah, blah, blah. And, but no one had ever said, hey, your dad, this is abusive what your dad is doing. Yes, yes. But I don't know if I would have been ready anyway because I was so ready to defend my dad because he was kind oh of all God. I had. I felt, uh, at least I believed that. It was like, this is, he's all I have around me on my side in a world of adults in a business that can be very strange a lot of times. And there were times where my dad did stand up for me. Like he's, you know, so I felt that loyalty to him where it's like when I didn't want to become the next white Chris Brown, like my record label wanted me to, my dad was the only one who was standing up for me in that position. So I felt this like intense loyalty to him because I'd had to, to, he was my dad, first of all, he raised me and, and then he had, stood up for me in certain times, but then also I was, the, I had to defend him so many other times before. Mm-hmm. So I got defensive with my mission president and I was like, no, I don't, I was like, he's never hit me. What are you talking about? There's, he hasn't, right. he's never abused me. So I right. thought it was ridiculous what he was saying. And he oh, just kind yeah. of, he's, he pointed out some things and I started talking negatively about myself and he just said, whoa, 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 whoa. He said, if you, th- because I was saying he, he has a point in this, he has a point in that. And my mission president said, I'm, I need to stop you right there. If you think any of this is true, and he was holding the papers up. He said, if you think yeah. any of this is true, wow, he's he has totally manipulated you and he has so much control over you. And, and he... And it took about 40 minutes of him tr- talking me through it until I finally accepted that there might there's other kinds of abuse that's not just physical, but there's emotional and mental right. abuse. I mean, 40 minutes is an impressive turnaround. I would say for me, it took like nine months. I, I, I had a very, mm-hmm. like my mission president would have, I would say was my, you know, was, was my first therapist. That was my, you know, that, that mm-hmm. person for me. And I, it's the parallels sometimes in our lives just really... I don't know what to make of them. It's something else. But my mom had sent me these emails, of all capitals, calling me a slut and a whore and all these mm. mean things because she had found out that I was in a relationship with somebody who was older than me. Little did you know, I, I had not had sex. I was not, you know, I, so she's, she's calling me all these things, but I, but I mean, just vicious, mean, brutal pages and pages of just malicious, manipulative talk that I Mm. thought was the reality. I like, I thought I didn't, I didn't read those and think, oh, this, this person's abusing me and this is unhealthy and I need to kind of collect my own thoughts. And if I'm going to try to have a relationship with this person, it was, it was just, oh, she's right. And I'm, I'm, I'm the devil and I'm terrible. And I'm, what have I done? And, and, and it, it was, it took somebody else ushering in the idea of this is abuse. And then I had the same reaction as you, David, where I was, I, I thought this year, no, 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 I don't need a therapist who's going to tell me about abuse. Like I, I, you know, I, I, I judged therapy and thought, oh, every therapist just wants it to go back to childhood trauma and oh, boo hoo. Mm-hmm. And no, my mom is everything yeah. to me. And my mom has helped me more than anybody. And I love my mom and she's right. my life. And I had this whole narrative about her that letting that go was, I mean, the most difficult thing I've ever done. Like it, it was the most identity throwing experience. And I had no idea who I was if my idea of my mom was reframed. Like that just right. made, reframing that made no sense with who I was at that time. Like accepting who oh, my man. mom was would mean changing everything about who I was, which was a really difficult cross to bear. Oh my goodness. Wow. You know what? And I feel like what's hard for maybe some, from an outside perspective for people to understand, it's like you're, you're raised in like two ways of like, you're, you're raised in a, you know, in our society, society, I mean, normally this is a healthy thing. Like you look to your parents for help and to sustain you and to guide you yes, and to keep you out of harm's way yes, and, and to confide in and trust in when you don't have anyone else to turn to. But what's hard is when you have a parent who's willing, maybe they don't even realize what they're doing, 
but they they do it and they are taking advantage of your trust in them and they raise you starting at an early age yep. to make you believe that you don't you can't do anything on your own and even up into your teenage years they make mm-hmm. you feel like well you're too stupid you're too stupid to even think on your own you're you will ru- ruin your own life if i am not in your life and uh, and since uh, they've been yeah. working on this since yeah. you were like a young kid like 8 9 10 years old even younger and they've had uh-huh. 10 years to work on developing you the way they want you to like my dad he could go uh-huh. for hours and hours every day talking to me i remembered like being a 12 year old and just wanting to get out of the room but he my dad never got tired he could go for three hours, even four hours sometimes, even five hours talking, convincing me. Like if I had disagreed on even anything small, he, we could spend hours talking about it until I just said, you're right. And after day after day, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you just mm-hmm, it's kind of like they in. condition you to be like, oh, you're right. I am too stupid to think of anything myself. Um, what what does my dad think? And there was even at points where I had fired my dad mm-hmm. from my career, but I was in meetings and my dad would be sending me messages saying, you are so stupid. You are going to ruin your career. No one knows you like I do. And all these things where I would be with my dad already fired. Uh-huh. I was an adult by the, I, I mean, I was like 19, even 20. And I would be in these meetings or on these phone calls saying, my dad had convinced me to say, on a phone call that he wasn't even on, where he wasn't working with me, saying, you know what, you should call my dad because uh, he would know better than I would. And so he would get on a phone call and basically no one wanted to work with me because he would convince them, he would talk to them and say, you can't work with my son unless I'm involved. And so from this way of, I don't know, just my dad knowing how to get to me I had to fire him three times and not once did I ever hire my dad. (laughs) Yeah. It's like the breakup that never ends. It's like, and so it was just, it was just weird. So, but I don't know. It was just, it was scary. Like I felt like I couldn't survive without him, even though I was in my twenties at this point, I was like, I can't survive without my dad. Oh my God. I relate so, so deeply. I found by understanding my dad, I found a lot of peace because I was like, you know what? Because I was seeing how my behavior and my past was affecting my relationship. Whenever I tried to get in a relationship, like these demons would pop up and start affecting whenever I tried to move forward in a happy relationship with somebody. Man, if demons were, if there was ever a place that demons showed up, isn't it intimate relationships? I mean, yeah. Oh my gosh. That's when they start screaming. It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And it's like, I don't know why it's like, I, anyway, um, as I saw how is it affecting me? Like I, I just wanted to understand where my dad was coming from. So even though I wasn't talking to my dad, I was, I was like, I'm going to treat my dad. Like he, he died. Mm. And there's no way for me to f- know who, why he is and why he was the way he was, except for fi- talking to the people he knew growing up. So I did. I talked to my grandpa. I oh. talked to some of my relatives, some of my dad's friends that he grew up with. I did like a lot of homework. Oh, I didn't and know then that. I would go okay. And, yeah. I would go and interview them and I would record them or some of them, not all of them, but oh, I, knew about I just the grandpa. asked them about my dad. Right, right. And so I didn't realize how much my grandma, my dad's mom, had an effect on my dad. She died when she was 40, 41 Mm. from mental health problems. And so I learned that my grandma left my dad when he was, and my, my, his sisters, when they were still kids, my dad was in high school and my grandma just left them to pursue a music career. And You're kidding. I, I had never, You're my dad never, me. yeah, isn't that crazy? My dad never talked about, he never talked about that. 
he never talked about my grandma to begin with. Other than that, she was, she had an amazing voice and she was in a lot of musicals. Okay. And that's about it. Like I didn't know much about, he, they wouldn't talk about her. It's sort of a um, secret. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I found out that even her, so I was like, I wonder, so then I talked to my grandma's uncle one time and I found out that even from a young age, when she was like a preteen, like 12 years old, her parents didn't know what to do with her because she was struggling with so many mental health issues. Mm. And I, when I tried to ask him what was going on, he was too scared to talk to me about it because mm. I guess it was still taboo back then. And he was still kind of in that tradition. He was, he wouldn't tell me he was, he literally was like scared. He, so it was, it was just very interesting. Um, but anyway, I, I, f- I felt like I gained a lot of compassion for my dad that even though I wasn't talking to him and I had, I had, a, I hate to admit it, I had a lot of hatred towards my dad. Like I didn't want to mm-hmm. ever see him again. I was so upset that he would do that to me, but mm-hmm. that he would do that to my mom because he was, everything he had done to me, he was doing to my mom and to my older sister. You know, a lot of the things that you had, your mom was calling you, he was calling my older sister. <sighs> and, um, and if, and it, it has really affected her. And um, so I was, I was just mad. But when I realized, I don't know, I, it just was very interesting for me to see what my dad had gone through and how he had tried to be a good dad. But what's weird is, I don't know, is it it's just weird. Well, and I'm sure it helped he, to change your perspective and, and empathize in a different way and, and, learn his struggles in a way that maybe you hadn't known before. Yeah. And I, I, the next time I had talked to my dad, even like, it was just weird. I still had a lot of issues with my dad of years following when I got back from Chile. But I remember having a conversation with him one time because I was trying to get my website back. He was holding my website hostage against me because he owned it. Which was kind of funny because this, he wouldn't. What? He was like, you know, I'm gonna. He said, I'm gonna put it under my name because just in case someone else, we don't want someone else to own it and take advantage <laughs> of you. And and the only person I had to worry about in the end was my dad doing exactly what he was telling me. I needed to be careful. So of. he's not giving you his, your own website with your own I name. Had, like, how does that? Yeah, work? he wouldn't give it to me because because the only way he would give it to me is if I came back into his life, which AK meant okay let me have him completely control my life again and basically ruin it. That's what my mission president told me. He said, if you let your dad come back into your life, he will destroy your life. And all the progress you've made over these last two years have gone completely to we'll waste. Go to, yeah, 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 yeah. So that really stuck in my head. And so I realized, you know, I'd gone through some therapy at this point and I, my sister, my young, younger sister taught me that if you want to have a conversation with dad, because he literally can go for hours without you even saying anything back. Hmm. She said, you just have to interrupt him. She's like, that's what I learned. You just have to interrupt him and act <laughs> like you didn't hear anything he said. I was like, what? <laughs> that's so rude though. Like they would get offended. She's like, trust me. I don't know why. I don't, but when you just act like you didn't hear what he said and you just keep talking about just what like you want, kind of he'll, yeah. he, he will go with it. And so I tried huh. it. He was talking about how hor- like he was going into like how horrible I was and how horrible my mom was, like he always did. And I just, I was just like, you know, what? I'm just going to talk about what I want. So I said, Dad, why don't, you, why don't you ever talk about your mom? Or I just said, or he said something about how like women, he'll never understand them, he'll never understand my mom. And I just said, I said, what you said, you never understand your mom. I mean, you never, you said you don't understand women. Was it hard for you to understand your mom? Mm. he's like, what? And so I just said, what was your relationship like with your mom? And and so I just started talking to him about that. And he started opening up. Yeah. And he was just like, my mom was never, it was just interesting to hear. And he, and he was open when, once you confronted him, he wasn't, he didn't try to end the conversation. He, he would always turn it back to, he would always try to turn it back to me and why I was such a horrible person, why I needed to have him back in my life or else I was going to be a complete, (laughs) 
Right. As you uh, do. Disaster. As you do. Okay. <laughs> and so I just had to keep acting like I didn't hear what he was saying and keep talking to him. Now, I don't, I, I don't want to say this works with everybody. Right, right. right. <laughs> it just, but it just happened to be the situation with my dad. And I, sure. I was able to learn. Learn. But anyway, I, I still keep my distance with my dad now. But so, I mean, all things considered, I think that's probably smart. <laughs> I would say that sounds like the smart thing to do. Yeah, yeah, in some ways. I mean, I definitely, I definitely feel like in some ways... Like, I wonder what my relationship with my mom would be if she were alive. And in some ways, I think Mm. it's easier that she is not because it's allowed me the space to to process things on my own time and to not have to deal with her constant, what I imagine would still be abuse. I don't know if it would have stopped. Like, in my mind, the fantasy if she were alive would be that I could confront her about the abuse, that she would own up to it and, and... I mean, an apology would have been the ideal. And then that we could Mm. kind of start a mature relationship with me being an adult, having my own identity and her accepting that and uh, trying to maybe find hers. But that's the fantasy. Like, I don't know what it really would, would be. And, and, Mm. and I, and it's, it's hard for me sometimes to, once I get caught up in that fantasy to accept like, no, that's probably a bit of a, of a far reach. And, and, it, the reality, if she were still alive, would probably be uglier than that. It 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 would probably be more difficult than than what happened with her with her passing and everything. Parents, mm. parents. So I want to be I want to be mindful of your time and 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 thank you for being so generous with it so far. Oh yeah, sorry. And I and I'm talking. I can talk so much now. I so I. Thanks I'm for listening to so, I'm my, so, oh my god I'm so grateful <laughs> I'm so grateful for to you for doing this and for this level of openness because I think I think it helps people I think this talking in this kind of way is is not to sound too corny but kind of the only way to heal and and I think there is a lot to be had by by the way that you're willing to open up so uh, thank you thank you